Hello, my name is Rosemarie Perrault. I work as a neuropsychologist at the Jewish Rehabilitation Hospital, and I will be presenting this information session on the behavior and cognitive changes that can happen after a stroke. After today's session, you should be able to better understand the most common behavioral and cognitive changes that tend to happen after a stroke, and you should be more familiar with some of the strategies that can help you cope with them. And the idea here is also that if you recognize yourself in some of these changes, you can go ask further questions to your team. Perhaps one of the first things we should do is to define what cognition means, because it's not a word that we hear very often. Cognition is all of the processes and mental abilities, such as memory and learning, language, reasoning, decision making, that allow us to function in our day-to-day -day life. Our brain is the control center of our thoughts, our personality, our behavior, and cognition. So any injury to it, such as a stroke, can cause changes in these domains. For some people, they will say that they don't recognize themselves anymore, so they see major changes. For example, someone who was rather discreet and who is now talking all the time. For others, they will notice that certain traits that they had before the stroke tend to be amplified. For example, someone who was a little irritable is now more impatient and more explosive. We will be describing many different changes in cognition and behavior, and perhaps you will recognize yourself or other stroke survivors you've met along the way in some of them and not others. What can explain this variability in the profiles that we see from one person to another? Well, in, ad in addition to our personality and the tendencies that we had before the stroke, different parts of our brain are in charge of different things or different functions. So depending on where the stroke happened in your brain, you may see different profiles. Cognitive sequelae are often experienced as frustrating because even though they affect us on many different levels, they are invisible and can sometimes be difficult to understand for ourselves and for the people around us. It can also happen that we're not fully aware of them in the beginning or that we don't see what the people around us see or what our therapists see. But it's important to understand that these sequelae are completely normal after a stroke, and in fact, up to two-thirds of stroke survivors experience them. Recovery happens mostly within the first months after the stroke, but also up to one year after the stroke, and then tends to stabilize, although some improvement can be seen even after the first year. Cognitive sequelae can impact rehabilitation, daily living, social interactions, and return to work or hobbies. The first change I want to talk about is slower processing speed. This is a change that many stroke survivors describe. Imagine that your brain is like a giant computer, super performant, and so big that it fills up an entire room. Now imagine that a stroke is like someone coming into this room with a small hammer and breaking a few wires here, a few connections there. Now when you turn on the computer, some things have changed. There are things that have been disconnected, short circuits. So messages and commands now have to travel using another route. They have to go around short circuits. So globally processing is slowed down and concretely what this can mean is that it can take more time to perceive things to understand what is said and to react what you can do if this is something that you are experiencing is to accept that things are taking more time now so not to try to go as fast as before keeping in mind that this is something that tends to improve with time. 
And if you are a close one, it can be a good thing to adapt your pace. So maybe to speak a little slower if you feel that that's something that can be helpful. Another change that can be seen after a stroke is impulsivity. So acting too fast, without thinking, without planning, um, sometimes in an unpredictable way. And the problem, of course, is that this can lead to risk taking. For example, transferring out of your wheelchair without taking the time to put the brake on and placing your feet correctly. So if you notice that you tend to be a little impulsive or you've been told that you are, what you can do is to try to find ways to pause before you act. And you can help yourself by placing, for example, visual cues in your environment. Um, for example, a post-it or a sign on your wheelchair that says, slow down. And if you are the close one of someone who had a stroke, um, you can help by encouraging your loved one to slow down um, and to reiterate the recommendations from the therapists. Attention problems are quite often reported after a stroke and can manifest themselves in different ways, such as slowness, distractibility, for example, having a hard time um, having a conversation in a noisy area. Uh, they can also manifest themselves as difficulty focusing or um, just feeling that you have less mental endurance when you are trying to focus, for example, when you are reading. And you can also experience more difficulty multitasking, for example, cooking while talking on the phone or driving while listening to the radio. And these attentional symptoms can be felt physically. So you could experience headaches or fatigue if you've tried to um, do something that required concentration for a while. Um, and it can also be felt mentally. So making more mistakes because of distraction or feeling foggy after a while when you are trying to focus. What can you do if you experience attention problems? One of the first things to do is to choose your moments, meaning that it's a good idea to get to know yourself and know the times in the day when you tend to feel more energetic and the times in the day when you tend to have less energy and to plan your activities around that if you can. For example, keeping activities that require more concentration for the periods of time when you feel more energetic and keeping um, relaxation or activities that require less uh, concentration for moments when you feel a little less energetic. You may also want to take more frequent breaks. So even though you may have been able to read for an hour and a half without taking breaks before, right now you may need to take breaks more often. And this could allow you in the end to continue doing your activity for a little longer. Doing one thing at a time helps a lot also. So this could mean, for example, instead of writing notes while you're listening to someone, you could ask them to give you written information so that you can focus on just listening to what they're saying. And lastly, avoid distractions. So if you need to focus, try to put yourself in good conditions, for example, in a place that it's not noisy and that doesn't have a lot of visual distractions either. Hemi neglect is something that can happen when a stroke affects the part of your brain that allows your body to orient itself in space. And typically, it will manifest as being unable to pay attention to the left side. It could also affect the right side, but that's not as common. And it's not a visual or an eye problem. It's really as if you forgot about the left side of your body or the left side of the environment around you or the objects on your left side. And so you could, for example, forget to shave half of your face or eat only what's on the right side of your plate. Um, you could 
not see the people or the objects placed on the neglected side. You could bump into things. Um, you could only be able to read words that are written on the right side of the page. And on the slide here, you have an example of someone who was asked to draw a face and they had hemi neglect. And so they only drew half of the face, the right half in this case. In the beginning, you will probably not be fully aware of hemi neglect because this is part of this condition. But as you get feedback from the people around you, your team members, um, your family members, you will get more and more aware and better and better at paying attention to your left. So what you can do as you become more aware is to try to force yourself to pay attention to the left side. And this is not easy and it takes time because it's not um, something that you will do spontaneously. So it takes a lot of cueing and reminders. And for close ones, what this means, uh, if you know someone with hemi neglect, is to remind them to look towards the left or pay attention to the left. Um, in the beginning, you'll want to place all necessary objects or important objects on the right, um, which is the side that they are able to pay attention to so that they can access them easily. But as they become better at paying attention to the left, then you'll want to place objects more on the left and place yourself on the left uh, when you want to speak to them so that they can practice paying attention to the left. When it comes to stroke and memory problems, memory can be affected in different ways. So you could have trouble with remembering recent events, for example, who visited you this morning or what you did the day before. You could have issues remembering more ancient parts of your personal history, for example, your address, your passwords, your PIN numbers. You could have trouble learning new information for example, remembering what was said in a conversation a minute ago or what you learned in occupational therapy a few days ago. Uh, you could also have trouble with time or space orientation, especially in the beginning. So remembering where you are, what day it is. And memory can impact very practical things as well. For example, remembering to take your medication. If you notice that you are struggling with memory problems, one of the first things to do is to take a look at the recommendations for attention that we discussed a little bit earlier on. Because attention and memory really work hand in hand, anything that you do to help your attention, for example, minimizing distractions or doing only one thing at a time, will also help your memory. You could also try compensatory strategies, for example, using alarms for things that you don't want to forget in your schedule, using a planner or using post-its as reminders of things that you want to do. And if you are the close one of someone who had a stroke and has memory issues, then you can help them by giving them cues or reminding them uh, about things that they are forgetting but using a principle that we call errorless learning, meaning that you would only present valid information and not, for example, give a choice of answers with some answers that are not true because you really want the right information to stick in their memory. When you have difficulties planning and organizing, you could have a harder time organizing yourself in activities, especially those that require many different steps or where you have to consider many different elements. For example, cooking a meal or managing your finances. You could have trouble planning all the materials you'll need for this activity or managing your time in an activity. Uh, you could also have difficulty managing a schedule and your appointments. So what you can do if you experience this is 
similar to what we talked about for memory. So you can use compensatory strategies such as planners, uh, calendars, and alarms to remind you of important things in your schedule. And if you're the close one of someone who had a stroke and is struggling with planning and organizing, then what you could do is offer help and supervision um, and reminders if needed. Apathy presents itself as a form of passiveness, slowness to act or react, or lack of initiative. It's most often observed in the weeks following a stroke. It's important to distinguish apathy from a lack of motivation. So in apathy, someone may feel a need, but not act upon it. For example, you could really appreciate your sessions in physiotherapy, but not put yourself in action to get ready and go to your session. Apathy is also not necessarily a depression. So in apathy, the mood is often blunt or flat, but not really sad. A note of caution here, apathy can be observed in depression, but usually in depression, we observe more sadness or more loss of interest or pleasure. However, if you're unsure about this or you're wondering about this, it's better to ask one of your therapists. If you experience apathy, keep in mind that this is a symptom that tends to improve with neurological recovery. However, there are things you can do to help yourself in the meantime. You could, for example, use alarms and post-its as reminders to initiate activities. If you are the close one of someone who sustained a stroke and has apathy, then you could cue the person to initiate actions. For example, you could encourage them to start an activity or even start doing the activity with them and they could then continue by themselves because getting started is often the hardest part here. Um, you could gradually reduce your interventions and in the end only be giving verbal instructions or verbal encouragements to start an activity. And it's also very useful to create routines so that activities are just part of an automatic daily routine instead of relying on initiative to get started. Disinhibition refers to the fact that thoughts, emotions, and behaviors come out without a filter. So this can lead to inappropriate comments or behaviors um, like swearing or being too direct. And of course, this can lead to awkward situations without you intending to. It's important to keep in mind that this is a neurological sequela and it's hard to control, but that it does tend to improve with neurological recovery. What you can do in the meantime is to inform your relatives of this so that there are no surprises and they better understand it and can help you manage it. For example, you could figure out a signal to diffuse uh, this behavior, um, a signal that could mean let's stop talking right now because um, there is a risk for a delicate situation. Um, if you're the close one of someone who exhibits this inhibition, then you could help them by changing the topic or redirecting their attention when you see that you're approaching a delicate situation. And you could debrief later uh, and try not to lecture. Another consequence of a stroke that can be hard to control in the beginning is irritability and aggressiveness, which can manifest itself as lower tolerance to frustration, for example, requiring immediate attention when you need something. And it can come out in excessive reactions, for example, screaming or swearing at your close one. Um, it could also come out in physical reactions like hitting, um, hitting your wheelchair or throwing a box of Kleenex, for example. And what you can do if you experience this is to try to notice when the frustration is building inside of you 
before you get to a point of no return. And if you can notice this, then take a deep breath and ideally leave the situation in order to calm down. And as you become more familiar with this, try to notice what tends to trigger you. If you are the close one of someone who struggles with irritability and aggressiveness, then the same um, recommendation applies, which is to leave the situation when you're feeling um, irritated yourself and go calm down somewhere else. I would like to end by encouraging you to talk to your relatives and to your therapists about the cognitive and behavior changes that you may have noticed since having your stroke or that they may have noticed because becoming aware of these changes and of the situations that tend to amplify them like fatigue, stress, um, new situations or noisy situations, for example, allows you to improve and allows you to better cope with them.